Bonjour, Willkommen and Howdy. And welcome to the latest Farg Motorpool video. This one is part one of a number in which we'll be restoring this behind me, which is the Peugeot P4. You can see in one of our earlier videos how we brought this into the UK and the absolute atrocious state that this was in before we started. So we've had a good clean down, we've had a good power wash, and now we're just back to basics. So what we're doing here in this first video is we're stripping down, we're having a look at the engine, whether it turns or not, we're having a look underneath, and then we will drain off the fuel off of this particular one so we can get some fresh fuel in there, we can put some new batteries in, and we can crank the engine to see if it, if it actually works. So this may not have been touched since about 2012. There was a uh, docket inside of the glove box and one attached to the engine saying uh, it needed parts and that was dated 2012. So we're looking at 10, 11 years uh, since this one was actually even looked at, let alone uh, ran. For the observant um, amongst you, you will see this in the top of the picture. I'll just uh, increase it, there we go, slightly. We've now invested in another microphone. So hopefully this one is more directional. You'll be able to pick up what I'm saying and hopefully the background sounds won't be too uh, uh, much of an interference. So with no further ado, let's have a look. We'll move around this particular vehicle and I'll give you a, a, a talking This comment. particular P4 is one from the middle of the production range. Uh, there's nothing particularly uh, special about this one. You can see already we've had uh, the wing off the front and around the front we've taken the radiator out which assists in access to the engine. Last night I changed the oil filter and I drained the vehicle of engine oil. So we're going to be putting in probably a 15W40 back into this so we'll uh, re-stock uh, the engine with oil in a moment. Also last night I was working on this here so these are where the batteries go and as you'll see underneath there's I've cut out uh, where it's absolutely rusted through and that was due to probably a battery explosion or leakage at some point in its past so I've made up these trays out of sheet steel I just need to weld these in to the bulkhead to hold both 12 volt batteries. Apart from that, the engine is covered in cobwebs. It really hasn't been used in a long while. Over here, I've also noticed, um, so this is the front cross member. Over here, you'll see there is a hole, and that is where the clutch slave, well, the clutch master cylinder was, which is missing. So we have one on the shelf, luckily, so we'll get that bolted in but it certainly means there'll be no driving of this even if we get the engine running. And also, if the fuel really has been in here for a number of years, we want to drain it all out because it's just going to push through a load of gunk into our injectors and give us a lot of problems. Interestingly, the French army here have bypassed this. This is the um, temperature control unit, so it senses how warm the engine is and reduces the revs accordingly. So when you get it in it's cold, it increases the revs, stays pretty high, and then as the water circulates around the engine and into this unit, it um, uh, releases on the wire here and the revs drop back down. So quite a good idea, actually. In fact, a lot of this pipe works to do with getting the engine brought up to speed quickly. These here are water pipes that go around the fuel supply to warm it and also there are pipes that go around the oil filter to warm it so therefore it's warming up the oil and the fuel at the same time as the engine and when it gets to the right level then it reduces the revs. With these as per any other motor car it's really to do with the seams of where things have been welded together and each of these uh, P4 seem to be coated in this marvellous sort of fire retardant uh, weather retardant rubber coating but if you get a chip in it the water gets underneath and then it blows outwards causing these sort of pockets of rust so we need to investigate that and it's quite a major hole uh, just here but that'll be easy to patch interestingly we've got something else going on here but that's not rusted through that might be just um, the uh, covering again but this one's pretty sound it's the seals where they usually go which is along here. Again, its fluid gets trapped. And the reason being, if we go up and in and have a look, 
if you see the seal here, they've actually got great big holes in them. You usually find, this is where all the excitement is, where we find uh, rounds and chewing gum, money in some cases, fallen down here inside of the footwell. And that drops down and is held here against the body. And then you usually get a rust line all the way along here. It's quite rare for you to get it down here, but it's certainly here where two panels join, you usually get it. I've replaced a lot of these areas before. You will get a small amount at the back here. You can see it's blistering, so we need to investigate what's happening under that. But again, that's just because dirt flick from the tyre sits inside of here, gets under that rubber coating and pushes it through. The wing had a small hole in it, but the reason we've, we've taken the wing off is it was dented. And because these um, uh, have a number of folds and curves within them, once you get a serious dent into the wheel arch itself, it's very difficult to knock that out. And we really don't use filler when we're doing any work here, so it's just a like-for-like -like replacement. Here's a driving position. Uh, looking at it, I can tell by the fact that some of these screws are Phillips head, uh, and in fact some of them are actually odd uh, that this dash or this element has been removed at some point in the past, because these were usually um, torque setting uh, little screws held in here. I can't comment whether this is the original mileage, so it says 39,000 kilometres. Um, looking at it, it's not actually in that bad a state. That might be correct, um, but certainly the vehicle has got a production date of uh, the early 80s, so it has been around the clock, possibly. The floors aren't bad. Usually you get a lot of rust here, which is around the front mounting point. Under this cap you find a bolt and that holds this body onto the chassis. And they usually rust just about here. And it's good on both sides. The floors are quite good. And again, looking on the seal here, looking along. And that's all in very good nick. Coming over to the back, again, exactly the same as on the other side, interestingly. Got a hole here. Your finger through that. Uh, the rest of the seal looks quite good. Oh, and really good news, we've got a plastic fuel tank. Now there are dark recesses here in the farm motor pool in which we keep a lot of our spares. Obviously as well we have quite a few vehicles lined up, so you can probably get a sense of here. We've got a lot going on in this particular shed. So in an earlier video you would have seen this, so that's the ERC. We've got Panard AML 90 in front of us, and for those they have got excellent eyesight, then, as we walk up what I'll describe as a tank shed, we have AMX 13 Obus. So that is basically one of the self-propelled gun versions. I'll see if I can get the door open, because it's quite stiff. Very dark in there. I don't know if the camera will pick that up very well. Missing the main armament, which isn't a problem. We've got the breech, the muzzle, and all of the lifting gear. It's just the barrel we're missing, so we'll just replace that with some standard rolled metal pipe. Try and shut the door on that, keep it out of the way. And over here, which will appear in some of the blogs moving forward, is our AMX 13 VTT. So this is the armored personnel carrier. Don't be mistaken by the fact that it looks like it's got wheels. Uh, it hasn't, it's tracked. It's just we're storing some wheels there against it. But anyway, that is all of a distraction. What we need to go and find is a petrol tank and the reason, well, diesel tank. And the reason is to be able to show you the differences between the plastic version, which is on the vehicle we're working on at the moment, and on the standard vehicle, which was a steel tank. So if we go in here, again, more interesting items. Nice French 1950s Renault lorry here. Up over the back, don't know if you can actually see it. We've got another um, Panard armoured car and just lots and lots and lots and lots of spares. Okay, so here we have the fuel tank. So this is the fuel tank that you would normally find in the Peugeot P4. It is metal, which is great, it's good, um, very robust. But the problems that you can get with these is again mud flicking up and sticking to the fuel tank because it's behind the rear wheels. You then start getting pinholes coming in the bottom of the tank. Sometimes you can get holes actually if it's really bad in the top of the tank and that's mostly due to this. So this is the, well goodness knows what, heat protection 
here for where the exhaust goes through so it doesn't heat the diesel up and this just as you can see just holds water against the tank and rots it through so the best type of tank to have in your p4 is going to be the plastic tank which is the same as they fitted in the mercedes-benz um, these plastic tanks were used in uh, vehicles that needed to go into the desert so they sometimes call them sahara jeeps and that's simply because they need a lot more uh, fuel because they're traveling longer distances so let's get back in let's get that um, uh, jeep up on the ramps and let's have a look underneath okay let's send her up the ramps we use here probably older than i am still do a good job and so hopefully so do i here we are there she goes now going underneath is going to be really dark so i'll do the best i can to light it up for you it's no good looking at a black cat in the course of it but yeah we'll have pop underneath and we'll see what the state of this one is okay so what am i looking at here so we're looking at the sump which is the bottom of the uh, peugeot engine got some slight leakage around there which is the sump plug but that was just me yesterday as i was changing the oil looking over to the springs looking down to the ball joints we've got quite a robust steering drag arm across there into the steering box we've got core sprung, sprung suspension and again over here we've got disc brakes on the front what I can tell by looking at these, even though this vehicle's not been used in ages, there's been full contact on that inside of the disc. When we take the wheel off, we'll be able to look on the, out, on the outside. But that indicates to me that when the brakes were working, if they are still, then they were having full contact, which should mean that we've got very good braking on this. I have seen others where it's only partial braking. This one looks actually, excuse me, going at an angle even better, actually. So that's really positive news, yet there are sort of stuff things growing in and around this one it's been sat for a very long time front axle mercedes you go underneath try and look for the markings on it you can just about make them out there so it tells you what the ratio is and the little mercedes markings there up in the uh, top right hand corner so mercedes chassis going through anti-roll bar on the back and then you can see the gearbox rear gearbox mounting if you watch one of our other videos we take one of these gearbox and engine out quite a simple thing to do and this is where you usually get the problems and we've got a little bit here so this is looking at the sill from underneath and what we've got here is a cross member and simply as the tire flicks the mud up it scores this rubber compound cover covering there i'm peeling it off and it holds the moisture underneath and rots it through so that's not a, a very difficult repair we'll just have to cut that entire section out and redo it it isn't really needed for structural sake um, but obviously that would be uh, MOT failure so we need to get that addressed and we can actually see the mounting here for uh, the body it looks very sound so we're pretty pleased with that following down on the inside here um, not bad not bad at all oh yeah and there we go again this is where this compound's been sat the water's got behind it we've got a little bit of rust there so that's not too bad looking underneath now interestingly so if I can point this out to you, I'm going to point with the end of the torch. This here is the load sensor. So thereby what's happening here is if there's a heavy load inside of the Jeep and it weighs down on this sensor, so therefore it's compressed against the axle, then the braking efficiency is increased to the rear of the vehicle, which is really, really good news. So it's like something you'd see on a commercial vehicle. It's certainly surprising to see it on sort of a four-wheel drive military piece of kit from the late 70s, early 80s. There's your springs at the back. Great, we've got, looks like, relatively new Bill Steins. Yeah, yeah, still got the markings on it, so shows that they were done relatively recently. Well, when the vehicle's running, and one enormous cobweb. I dread to find what's created that, but I'm sure it's around here somewhere. Again, going back along the sill on the other side, we just got some surface on here, so it's a relatively small amount of work needed on the body. Um, usually these are all pretty bulletproof underneath, so you've got a little dampness here and there, but nothing's going to, uh, to write home about. The gearbox, you see, there's quite a lot of linkages involved, so we need to make sure that all these are oiled and greased, and then we get to the infamous transfer box. And what a hefty piece of kit 
that is as well. Again, additionally, it's a Mercedes unit. And so you can actually see with the engine here, the output from the gearbox travels through a very small um, prop shaft and that goes into the transfer box and then it transfers across and back out to the front axle. Okay, so it's very different than on the uh, Hotchkiss Jeep. And then obviously on the rear, you've got the output here and this travels all the way to the rear axle. Again, a uh, Mercedes unit. I've got this jacked up at the moment as I was just testing to see if the brakes are binding and they're not. The wheels are turning really quietly and slowly, which is fantastic. And over here, which we're going to drain out next, is the fuel tank. This is the one of the plastic fuel tanks. If I go outside and show you, I'll come in again around here. You can actually see it in all of its glory. It's quite a big tank. Don't ask me how much goes in there. All I know is it costs a load of money to fill it up. So I'm expecting about 150, I don't know, 7,500 litres. I don't know. We'll fill it up and we'll find out. Okay, brilliant. And there's not much rot in the back either. Um, for those P4 spotters amongst you, the rear light clusters are I, uh, CB ones, I believe. So they're slightly different design than normal. But apart from that, there's nothing uh, particularly special or abnormal about this particular vehicle. So we, fingers crossed. Oh, there we go. You can see the, uh, the ratio and the Mercedes badge on the back. That unit here, I believe that's the one to do with the um, rear diff locks. Okay, I spoke about the front wing earlier and to the untrained eye maybe, this doesn't look too bad, but what we've actually had here is a compression upwards. This is buckled, this element here. It also looks like I've been pushed in at this point. So there's a multiple things going on. This would need sorting, that, this, here, and down there, and all of this. It's quite a good deal of work to actually uh, sort out, but what we have managed to do is procure another wing. So look at this one. You can actually see the difference. See how this protrudes outwards rather than pushes in. And this is looking in fairly good nick all the way along. So we'll be using this one instead. So I've been out to the back, dug out a jerry can ready for us to put the waste oil in for onwards recycling. Oh, I won't be able to use that particular funnel, I'll get another one. Interestingly, only just noticed when we were picking it up, 1942 genuine Wehrmacht. So not bad that we're sort of draining fluid from what was essentially a German vehicle into a German jerry can. I am an internal optimist, much to the annoyance of many people. Therefore, I believe that we have diesel in there, but only just enough to fill up this jerry can, cut the side out. So if we drop it in there and it overflows, then it shows my optimism was ill-placed. But usually they didn't leave very much in these, so, but I will go and get a secondary container just to be on the safe side, because we did this on a tank once and we managed to soak all of the concrete apron outside, much to the annoyance of everyone that's to drive through it. So I need to get a secondary container and then we will undo the bung and see how much fuel we've got. So here we are. Okay. Gently does it, don't want to break the tank. Right, okay, he's undoing, that's good. Let's get the uh, container across. It doesn't go everywhere. Back up again. I'm going to lower this raft down a bit. There we go. We can see where we are now. So let's move this back a bit. There we are. So let's have a look. That's diesel we got in there. There's lids. Hold them. Cool. So we're looking if there's any water comes out first. Because usually the water will go to the bottom of the fuel tank, especially if it's sat for a long time. The colour of the fuel looks 
pretty clear. Okay, so that's filling up quite quickly. I want to make sure I've got my second container here. I need to catch it. And I'm going to get away from it. So I'm going to get this back. Although, as I love diesel, I'm covered in it. It's never a great idea. Oh, there we go. So, my optimism was not misplaced, but they never seem to have put more than 20 litres of diesel in one of these ever whilst they were in storage obviously but that was white diesel and by well, the smell of it, it smells quite fresh actually like very fresh so um goodness that's not very old at no, all there's no um there's no deposits inside i couldn't feed any whoops now the diesel's running down my arm and um, into my jacket Well, I'm very pleased with that. I mean, someone at some time did something because that was pretty good. So the oil filter on these Peugeot P4s is a standard uh, filter type. I think the number's written on the side of it. Um, and they're actually facing upwards in a lot of cars, especially the classic cars I've worked on before, they usually hang downwards off the bottom of the engine. Uh, to get these off, usually you just unscrew them. You may find they're very tight, so some people punch a screwdriver actually in through the cartridge and then use that as a lever to move it around, but that can be quite mucky. I use one of these. I'm sure most uh, people who have done work on cars will recognise that. And that wraps around the actual filter itself, and then you use, it bites into the cartridge and then by moving that around that undoes it. This one was really, really difficult actually to get off. It was really very well uh, attached. Well, we've got it off, got a nice new one on there. And I always just put the date on the top so we know the last time we changed the oil, especially when vehicles get moved around. And you've got a few of them, you can't remember what you did last. So what we're gonna do in this very, very short video, uh, part of this blog, is to just add the engine oil. So not exactly a stimulating video, but maybe some people have never changed the oil in a car or a Jeep. So I'll just show you how astonishingly easy that is. So here on the top of the engine is the rocker box. Down here is the actual oil dipstick. So pulling this out will show us if there's any oil in there. I know there's not, because I drained it out. So some vehicles, actually certainly Peugeot's, have filled the engine oil went in around the dipstick, but not on this particular case. It's up on the top of the rocker. And this is actually the breather. Now I put a note on there because needs oil it says because we don't want to uh, periodically we have different people working on different vehicles and we certainly don't want people trying to start this so we've got to be quite gentle with these because they can be brittle they're made of plastic they're not screwing they're just pushing i'm just screwing it there to make it a little bit easier there should be a um a gauze in there oh, there we go to stop the worst of any lumps going in so I'll put this to one side and let's decant some oil and fill it up so first things first Here's our jug. Now this engine takes about four and a half litres of oil. I always buy my oil in 25 litre containers. My goodness, does it make a difference in the price. If you were just gonna go into a reputable, well-known high street shop to buy your oil, you might buy enough for your car. I think modern cars, some are on three and a half litres or just four litres. Um, and you might buy a gallon of oil there. You could be looking at 17 to 22 pounds depending on sort of the quality of it i'm buying mid-range oil and this equates to about nine eight pounds nine pounds a liter so does um warrant buying a larger amount so but we do have to decant into this measuring jug so i've just cleaned it out because goodness knows what was in there before and it's got markings on there i'll do a liter at a time so we're not operating any extreme environments here. So a normal mineral 15W40 we're using this engine. We make sure we change our engine oil once a year, whether the vehicle's been used or not, uh, because the oil can go slightly acidic if it's sat around um, and if it starts mingling with the existing oils in the engine. I won't be putting a flush in this. We'll be putting the straight 
mineral oil in, but we'll change it again after we've ran the engine, more or less immediately, and put a fresh amount of oil in so it's uh, well lubricated and very well clean. So if we can get this in, which I know probably end in disaster, because I'm doing it from the wrong angle so you can see what's going on. So let's see if we can get him going. Oh no, he's in. There we go. So you've seen in other videos me filling engines with oil. If that's your thing, then by all means, put a note below and I'll make a complete video of just filling engines. Uh, but I know for the rest of you it's probably like watching paint dry, so I will edit the video now and get to the point when we finished it. So we filled the engine up. I've actually put in four and a half litres. So it was as expected. I'm just going to pull the dipstick out. I'll have a look at it. Okay, a bit difficult to tell when the oil's new, but that looks like it's on or about full. I'm not actually worried about going over too much on it because usually I would have filled the oil filter, but because the filter on this one's upside down, filling it up and then putting it on, all the oil leaks out and goes all over the engine, so it's a right mucky um, operation. So therefore, we will lose a tiny bit of oil into that oil filter permanently. So I'm gonna lift it again. Right, there we go, it's showing us just over full. Not really worried about that. I haven't got a catalytic converter on this. So a little bit of extra engine oil, we just burn off. Not great shakes. What I'm gonna do now is we're gonna fiddle around and get into the fuel. So this is the fuel filter. At the top here, we've got a bleed nipple, so we will um, probably not need to bother with that. But down the bottom, it's a bit tricky to get to. I need to move the vehicle around a bit. Um, there's a drain, and I'm gonna undo that and let some of the fuel out. Look at the color of it. If it's any good, do it back up. If not, I'll let the whole lot come out, and then we'll have to sort of manually pump it through. If you want nice, fresh fuel going to the very dirty injector, which we'll have to look at next. So hopefully, Certainly, later on in this blog, we will slap the batteries in, wire it up, see if we can turn it over, um, at least. Obviously, without a radiator and no coolant, we don't want to run it. It's just to turn it over, and if it does catch, brilliant, but we'll switch it straight off, and we know we've more or less got a good engine. Hi. So, for those of you who have not done welding before, then we're going to be using metal inert gas, MIG welding, to do these battery trays. I'll show you where we're going with them. There we go. Just prepared them now. They're just getting uh, paints just drying on them and we'll put them in and we're gonna do small seam welds rather than spot welds as was originally there because it just makes it a little bit more robust going back in. So metal inert gas, how does that work? Basically you have a gun and by pressing the button you can see then a wire comes out the end of it. When this creates a circuit back to the unit itself through um, a, a earthing clamp, then it just simply arcs. And that arc burns off a tiny blob of weld off the end, um, and then uh, it arcs again. And it consistently does that. So it's going da -da 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 all the time, using up this wire. As you press the trigger, then it comes out. And then what that does is build up a pool of weld, and you're able to move through that using wearing one of these. Make sure don't burn your eyes out. Move through that all the way along. Now everything should go to plan as long as you've got your settings right. So you don't want to go, you don't want too much wire coming out the end because it'd just be pushing back and jumping and not arcing properly. You want to have enough wire coming out because otherwise it just burn the tip off. So when you're uh, starting out, it's like I was a few years ago, I was getting through a lot of tips. So it's really turn that back down. So on this at the moment, I'm using a Clark weld. So I think there's like six settings on it. So I'm doing three as in the power we're using because it is pretty um, a, a thick bit of weld I'm gonna do. And the uh, wire feed rate is about two and three quarters, maybe three as well. And then when you're doing it right, you can hear it and it sounds like bacon frying. So that means that you're doing it right. So it's a zzz as it goes along, fingers crossed. But when you've got gunk and rust and under seal and paint and God knows what else in there, no matter how much you clean it up uh, and oil, then you will find it a splatter a bit. So uh, that's why you need one of these. Top tip before you start welding, make sure that the, uh, 
the gun is nowhere near the earthing clamp because you don't want any uh, necessary sparks. There we go. I'm just going to eject a bit of wire and I'm going to pull it out slightly so the tension's there with these cutters and off with the end of the wire. Now I've got a nice sharp point uh, on that feed wire and that will arc really easily uh, onto the vehicle and then we'll get a really good weld. Now I've not used uh, we're using the GoPro on this. I've not done that before on the welding. I think I'm not going to, just in case it burns the lens out. So what we'll do is you'll see me welding. We can actually see it doing it until we've actually finished. Hopefully that's okay with you. So I'm just going to get some uh, safety gloves and get the panels in and we'll kick off. Eyes. Okay, not too bad. Eyes. So, not my finest welding, I must be honest, uh, because there was a bit of rust left uh, underneath and it splattered a bit. But all we're trying to do is just do uh, a weld here. We can't do a continuous seam weld as it works out. There's actually an electronic box uh, just behind here. We don't want to put too much heat into it because it's going to create issues. Um, I'm just, we're just touching up um, uh, the edge along here. So this will all be cleaned up and we put um, seam weld on it and we'll paint all of this and then the batteries can go back in. I'll get on with the next one now. Draining off the fuel filter is a bit more of a faff than expected. There's a plastic nut on the bottom. And you really got to be careful with it because if you snap it off, then we're in a whole lot of trouble. So best not. I think the thing is we need to get it out. I'll show you where it is. So as you can see, here, here is the uh, fuel filter and the actual nut is right down the bottom. So I think the best thing to do is to undo this and take it lift it off so we can at least see it then uh, and what we're doing so we don't break that bleed nipple off so we'll just remove this now the unit's unbolted now so you can actually see on the bottom there's this wire that goes in that's a sensor for water uh, inside of the filter and that shows up on the dash and there's our little bleed nipple which you can probably just about see so the good thing about Getting at this angle, let me give you some more light. Whoops. Good thing about doing it at this angle is we can undo it and it won't go all over the place. So yeah, the diesel seems to be pretty clear inside of there. I was thinking it might have been dirty, but no, um, and there's hardly any in there. Right, battery trays are in. I'm not going to put the batteries in the vehicle. We'll do them on the floor and I'll put jump cables up. Um, we've cleaned out the fuel tank, the main fuel tank, and the filter now. So we have a jerry can of diesel. So we'll top it up. I'm only going to put about 10 litres in there, just enough to sort of uh, get around the system. And then we'll uh, see if we can spark it up, see what happens. This one has been sat for a very long time. As we saw in the earlier video, they had trees and God knows what else growing in it. So I'm not hopeful, to be absolutely honest. So I've checked the engine, it does turn over by hand, um, but those starter motors sat out in the open. Uh, God knows what happens to them. So I'll, I'll, I'll fill it up and we'll go from there. We're going to crack off the fuel feed pipe into the injector, which I thought was going to be easier than that. And we will hand prime using the pump on the top to see, to check that we have fuel flow. And for some reason, that's not wanting 
to come off, even though we've got the Jubilee clip off. So let's just let's see if this can lift it. There we go. Here we are. So here's the fuel feed pipe. We'll put it into there and we just start pumping. You can see this is on the uh, top of the fuel pump as a hand primer. So the moment of truth, what we're going to try and do is get the engine to run. Uh, we've got fuel to it, I've done all the work on the injector. We haven't got a radiator and we haven't got coolant in it, so we can't run it for any great length of time. All I'm going to do is put on the glow plugs, get it started, let it turn over a few times and then turn it off. So that proves the point that we've got a running engine. So definitely not used since 2012, it could have been longer. It looks like the engine was rebuilt in the year 2000, so it's not an ancient engine, it's about 20 odd years, so it's bound to have a bit of life before it's put in. So um, let's give it a go. So, battery's on, ignition's on, I'm going to put the preheat on, you can hear the um, solenoid clicking across. Let's give it a go. running particularly well there but let's get the uh, coolant back in radiator back in so we can run it for some length of time and then we'll fiddle around um, with some of the settings but yeah we've got a working engine right so we've just put the radiator back in so cleaned it painted it up um, always paint these in a dark matte color because it helps radiate the heat I've seen some people they get their old radiators and they take all the paint off of them polish them up because they, they're sort of brass underneath and think, oh, that looks fantastic. But it doesn't uh, transmit the heat onwards very easily. So that's why radiators are always black and always matte, because it gets rid of the heat really quickly. Wherever I've been on this, I'm going to use new fasteners going back in, because the ones that came out were a bit on the manky side. So radiators in, we'll get the uh, water hooked up, and we'll get the engine running while we go investigate some other things. So. Let me crack on with this and be back in a moment. We try to bleed the system down because with the diesels you don't want to get air in the system because then the engine won't run properly. Um, and so we were finding we weren't getting any sort of uh, fluid out of this, which is the fuel uh, filter. It's also piped into, as you can see here, the hot water system. It's quite an interesting design where it puts hot water around the actual fuel itself to try and get it ready for the engine. Um, so we've taken it out, we've put another one in. Um, I must admit we just turned it over a couple of times on the starter off camera just to make sure we've got fluid pumping out the end of this. So what we're going to do now is start it up and see if we can run it. So uh, bear with me, I'll just go around. And this time I'm going to put the glow plugs on so it's going to take about 10 seconds. So ignition, so yeah, we've got red warning light on the dash. Pulling the plunger out halfway, and that's warming up. The elements, I can see here on the dash, it starts to glow. Okay, here we go. Okay, after bleeding out the air, we found that the engine's running over lumpy, and then when you rev it, it's um, pumping out an incredible amount of uh, unburnt fuel out the back. So that probably means when the injectors have gone. So just removed one of the four, and I'll take you into the inner sanctum in here. And this is where we're testing it. So this is a tester for injectors. So basically there's a reservoir at the back that you fill with diesel. 
there's a handle here that you operate and it brings the pressure up and then it will go across and then the spring will be released and poof, you'll see some uh, vapour coming out the end. So let me just tighten this up and then we'll see what happens. So we've had a go at these and they're coming out as a stream of diesel. We've now got one back in the tester and we're going to compress this one. So here we go. All right, did you see that? So that's coming out like an aerosol. So that is a good injector. And these are bad injectors, naughty injectors. They're going to go to the scrapyard. Well, probably cheaper to get them, buy new ones to get these fixed. <laughs>